Hello, everybody, and welcome to the world of 2021, the year that I'm calling the year of the data wars. Recently, AppLove and a major ad network and game studios announced the acquisition of Adjust, which is a company known as an MMP or mobile measurement partner. Zynga recently announced its intentions of acquiring an ad network, including supply and demand side tech, mediation, and an MMP. So the potential implications of these kinds of vertically integrated acquisition with the game studio business pose a number of conflicts and dangers to potential customers of the ad networks. So to talk through the potential dangers and try and discuss these issues in a balanced way, we have first, actually, Filippo DeRose, head of growth at Traplight, also previously at Pixelberry and a former customer of AppLovin. Second, we have Aviad Dadown, Chief Strategy Officer at BitShake, and we'll also talk a little bit about why you are actually in a very interesting position with respect to the conversation we're going to have today. Third, we have Josh Burns, founder of Digital Dev Connect, a games industry veteran and neutral party. Are you neutral, Josh? <laughs> I think you're yeah. relatively neutral. Absolutely. And, 100%. and finally, we have Josh Chantley. COO of Wildcard Games and current customer of AppLovin. Right, Josh? That's right. All right. So getting started, I wanted to start by posing this question about the general danger of having an ad network tied to the same organization that owns game studios that could potentially be competitive. This was the original AppLovin model. And so I was wondering if you guys could speak to the potential dangers of this model. And anyone want to kind of jump in on that? Yeah. Filippo, what do you think? Well, um, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, market consolidation for sure. Um, whether it's, uh, and, you know, for some, it's great for business. Now, whether we want to, uh, discuss too much ethics uh, around it. Um, that's Pandora's box, and maybe we should leave it there. Well, I mean, let's let's kind of get straight to the point here, right? I mean, I think there have been a number of allegations, not not proven, but a number of allegations that AppLovin used customer data, Playrix, Pixelberry, and others, and used it to compete against their own customers, especially on the hyper casual side, right? That's the allegation. Now, nothing is proven, but a number of people in the industry talk about that. What do you guys think about that danger or some of those allegations? Yeah, I mean, those allegations are indeed correct. This uh, exacerbates the situation because acquiring uh, a company with this information, with this data, will enrich in the data that they previously had. Yeah, so I think we should rewind, like, right? because it might not be obvious to people what what the value is, right? So the value here is. You know, if I have insight into the performance of other games and I can build games myself, then obviously I can, you know, build similar content, right? Also, if I'm able to see games that are early in testing, uh, then I can, you know, even further, you know, do that in a more advanced stage. Right. Um, so, I mean, uh, you know, I think it's it's important to understand that. But then there's also the marketing side, right? Like once my sort of similar version is in the market, I can maybe have insight into the mar marketing strategy, uh, create, you know, that kind of details to sort of uh, accelerate um, right. or have and, an and advantage. Another point is if I'm on the supply side and I'm selling my users, then I can decide who do I want to sell and how am I pricing it according to the user value or to the bids that I have in the network, right? Right. So you're getting information about, you know, not only the types of games that are doing well, you're getting information in terms of like IPM and the conversion of some of these ad creatives against specific networks. You're also using third-party data like App Annier Center Tower. You kind of you can kind of see the revenue data as well, and you can kind of triangulate a little bit in terms of the performance of some of these games. So it's pretty critical information that could be used to then say, okay, here are the specific kind of game genres, games ad creatives and ways of really, you know, kind of be becoming highly performant from, from a, a kind of games perspective. Well, and I think also the next step from say, I have a similar game to one that's in the market is like, if I have control of, you know, 
my level of sophistication on that, the network side is much lower than you guys. But if I have control of the inventory, I can do things to try and, you know, maybe eat a lot, take a loss uh, to in the longer term. Think of like the Zynga Facebook model, right? Where it's like, if I can capture the market at a loss now, then I can, you know, be profitable like in the longer term. And if I have control of this inventory, theoretically, there's no sort of direct costs for me to out of pocket costs. And I have that control to like push and direct it towards specific things. Like that's a pretty difficult hill for someone to climb if they don't have access to it. Yeah. So Josh Chanley, so you're you're a current app loving customer. So let let's keep this balanced. Like you're you're you know they've got you're kind of using app loving, but you know obviously if you're using them, you're not concerned with some of these issues. So uh, what would you say on the flip side of that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, I definitely see these issues as as real. Um, I think we're maybe conflating two issues a little bit where. Okay. I think it's fair to say that having large competitors that are substantially more vertically integrated than you are is something, regardless of industry, you should be concerned with. Um, sure. That said, I also actually think there are two competitors for our users' time that are substantially more vertically integrated than AppLovin and that we all do business with, Facebook and Google. Um, there, there's something more there that people are conflating mm -hmm. with the vertical integration issue. Um, and it's the, it, it's the more direct competition. And I think that a lot of people are feeling um, paranoid about how their data will be used. I think that for partnerships to be durable, they need to be based on trust and mutual respect. Um, and I think that that is something that I think people are having trouble with. Right. Um, but you know, I, I would kind of characterize it a little bit differently. Like yeah. I would characterize what AppLovin is doing and what Zynga is potentially doing as competitive risk. I would characterize Google and Facebook as margin risk, right? Like, can I trust them with my data? And then will they steal my margin? And I, I absolutely think that's a, that's a real risk. Although now they're kind of getting pushed out. But you know that. But that's how. To your point, let's not conflate those two things. But that's how I would personally look at those two. Well, if you look uh, at growth, go ahead. sorry, Josh, go ahead. Oh, I, I had a minor comment where uh, I, I I kind of see your point, Joke, about um, kind of margin risk, where Facebook and Google are able to push us on margins by increasing the price of their inventory, where Apple then can to an extent do that. But if they launch a game that directly competes against you. That's yeah. less of a marketing pressure and more of a direct competitive threat. Right. I'm not sure if that's exactly what your point was, but that's yeah, yeah. That and by the way, Facebook and Google do that because they are a sand self-attributing network. They do that opaquely, right? Like yeah. they know all of my revenue. They they know my margin. <laughs> they they know my cogs, right? right? And so they could they could literally just they could optimize and say, hey, you're only going to make this much money, and they know that that's. That's what I'm going to be happy with. I mean, we're kind of going a little bit off tangent now, but but we, maybe we could do another podcast on the, the dangers of, of that side. But that's kind of how I think about it. Right. And I think that Applovin has another dimension for being a game developer, right? So they can not only see your margin, but they can also snitch your, you know, your top right. users. They can maximize revenues from them by crossing them into their own apps. Um, and and don't forget, they also have a publishing business, right? So they can they can choose from the top performing games in their network and then run yeah. publishing contracts with them. So there is two more models that Applevin can gain value from um, in, in comparison to Facebook and Google. Right, but actually, but, I, I'm wrong. It is not off topic what we just talked about because to the point about Applevin <laughs> acquiring Adjust, now they pose a competitive risk and the margin risk because you could argue that the reason why Apple and bought adjust is to try to become a SAN, right? Yeah. Wait, sorry. One thing I wanted to, to touch on because I'm supposed to be the balance, the balance <laughs> view is, so I actually, so when Apple uh started launching, you know, formally announced, so, you know, getting into content space, right? A lot of us talked about like, oh man, like people who are in hyper casual are going to, 
bail out and they're not going to work with them. You know, here we are, whatever months later, and that's actually not the case at all. Like I actually looked last night through the companies that have like that using the app love and like SDK, which is not like the best proxy, but like it's basically everyone. Nobody's moved away from, from working with them. So like as much as we kind of like to intellectually talk about this stuff, like the reality is there is a bottom line, right? If I can drive revenue, then maybe I, that overrides any concerns around this. Cause if you look like every hyper casual studio still, you know, has them integrated the majority of folks using any type of ad monetization uh, are, uh, I mean, it's Zynga, it's, you know, pretty much everyone. So that's the counterpoint, right? Is like, there's yeah, kind of this like intellectual. The, yeah. But the ahead. counterpoint to that is want to have to, right? Like, you know, to get some scale, it, it's kind of hard to do that on your own at this point. Well, but don't you feel like there's enough other options out there where if you have like a sort of uh, personal view that you like, you know, you should move away from it yeah. that you can well, probably I mean, get. I, I personally, it, it, like I personally hate working with Facebook and they having all of my information and then being able to potentially choose whatever margin they want for me. But am I going to use Facebook? Yeah. <laughs> well, think yeah, about there is, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, what I was uh, going to point out before is there is a, a fundamental um, challenge in growth, which is putting your content in front of users, right? Uh, and distribution power. And what we do in growth is essentially make that engine as efficient as possible. And to do that, we're constantly iterating and testing. And, you know, we have some the famous uh, CAC LTV equation, we have some expenditure and we have to try to make the best of that expenditure and hopefully make profit on top of it. If they have gained a massive leap forward, and it's a big if, you know, of making that engine super efficient through these acquisitions, then clearly their content is gonna be distributed much faster and much more than our content my content, Josh's content, and we're, and our efficiency will automatically be penalized by that. So making our <laughs> cost uh, maybe higher, maybe more inefficient, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the real issue here is, you know, as, as we try to be in this world of protecting privacy, we, we also want to ensure that consumers get tons of different content and not just the same content from the same company uh, and making it harder for everyone else. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think it comes down to the user experience, right? It's going to be much more difficult for new developers to design games that will compete with the big ones, right? The big ones right now have so much data on the UA side, on the, uh, um, on the LTV side that they don't really need to uh, put too much effort in developing innovative games. They just need to develop a repeti repetitive games that will look the same way and will keep monetizing the same way. They know the margins, so it's it's an economical business. Um, but for new developers who are really putting the efforts in creating great content, unfortunately, this content will not get to the users unless they will go through those big networks, right? So eventually, it, it, the, the consolidation creates, um, unfortunately, maybe, I don't know, but it could create a, um, a worse user experience when it comes to, to, to the new game designs that are coming to the market. Yeah, I mean, I think to me, it's, you know, like riffing off what Filippo said is like thinking like short term versus long term, right? Like near term. I'm profitable because I'm working with them. Like that's the, comes to the bottom line, but longer term, like what are the implications of, of having this, you know, you know, supporting this type of partnership for my overall business. Right. And so that's like very hard to quantify. And especially in a business where like, you know, it's very quantitatively driven. It's probably maybe hard to think about it from that perspective when you're operating something, you know, in real time. Right. So guys, yeah, I mean, we, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Josh? I, I was going to say that there, there's definitely a, a combinatorial explosion in terms of factors to consider when you're making this decision. Um, I think there, I tend to hear extremes about what to do. 
like uh, like one extreme point of view I think is most popular right now is that it's like the dark side versus the light side. And then another view that I hear very quietly in the background usually is like there's this big growth rocket and it's taking off right now. If you grab onto that rocket, it's going to take you places. Um, those are two different ways to, to look at App11. Um, and the res truth is probably not whether you should or shouldn't work with App11. It's probably how, um, where, why, when. Uh, these are probably um, what we should be focusing on long term. But because of the number of variables and the things that we don't see at play, it's very hard to know that you're making the right decision. Right. Okay. So and I think that a good a good example, just like a last point, is Fortnite. Uh, you know, it's probably the the best content that we've seen in the last years. Uh, and they fought it. You know, they they went into the fight with Apple on the on the on the margins, and eventually they they won because they had great content. But how many companies can can go into this? Uh, uh, into this fight with with the big guys, right? Not many, even if they have great content. So I think it's a, it's it's a good example for that. Okay, and so now we we've kind of talked at the ad network level and talked about you know the power of distribution things of that nature. Now I wanted to kind of have us go down to the level of the MMPs. And first, maybe what we could do is I don't know if for our audience out there who doesn't understand what an MMP is, maybe one of you guys can give a really quick description or kind of explanation of what an MMP does? Aviad, best person for that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Before yeah, an MMP is a mobile measurement partner. What they do is basically uh, attribute the uh, install to the right network, campaign, ad sets, so people can know exactly where the users are coming from. The problem is that many of the networks are self-attributing, so they always want to attribute the install to themselves so they can generate more value to the advertiser and, and hopefully get more budgets. Uh, but eventually in the world we're living in, there's a lot of clicks happening across networks and it's not always easy to understand who is uh, the right network to credit for a specific install. This is why we need MMPs uh, to be unbiased as possible and tell us exactly which network uh, was the most valuable for us and and we right. should invest more in that. Right, so Aviat, so the, the base functionality MMP telling you where did an install come from, but in addition, you're also generally sending other events, right? Like revenue events, conversion events, things of exactly. that nature. Yeah, it's so, all tied back to the install, but eventually you're able to track uh, all the uh, the, the entire funnel of events that a uh, user performs inside your game, right. uh, basically tracking it with an SDK, and then you can attribute it back to the install time. Right, and I, I would is, say, oh, go ahead. I think that is where the majority of the value ends up coming from. So right. I think earlier this month, App11 made a major announcement where they're launching a new product called Predict. And essentially, it's taking all of those additional events in addition to your install, and using machine learning to create a model to predict the LTV for your players based on the value of those events sending back um, to help understand with or without IDFA, the performance of marketing. So I think that's a testament to just how predictive um, and um, descriptive of your players those events are. The fact that MMPs are going to rebuild their products around how valuable they perceive that data to be. Right. So, so let's kind of talk about, so th this is a little bit complicated. So from MMP perspective, we've kind of described what an MMP does, and then you can then try to extrapolate. So, so the dangers of that is, do you want a competitor to have your install information also, you know, pretty much getting a full picture of your COGS, your revenue, <laughs> you know, your, your kind of uh, growth trajectory, all of that kind of information, right? So then the question, I think that the question that people are going to have to answer for themselves is like, do you want a competitor to have that information? And uh, maybe the other question I, I should ask is that, you know, the second 
line of thinking is post IDFA, how much of a full picture are MMPs going to have? So how dangerous is it? I think before IDFA, super dangerous, absolutely, in my opinion. But now that we're, we've got this SK ad network, meaning you're, you're getting a very limited window to get like conversion events, like first 24 hours, and you only get like one aggregated value of what a, you know, what a conversion, one specific conversion event that's defined. So to Josh uh, Chanley's point, you know, that's why App Lovin is building. And I, I think Apps Flyer also has predict S SK or something like that, where they're trying to then take the limited data from SK Ad Network and then try to predict stuff. But maybe you guys can comment on now, on top of the Ad Network stuff at the MMP layer, whether it's App Lovin or a Zynga with all this information, what are your thoughts in terms of the danger of having an external third party have access to this data? Well, um, just building off quickly what Aviad was saying before, which is the independent measurement provider. We're clearly losing the word independent there. Yeah. Um, there is a precedent to this. Uh, some people may recall a company, for example, called Omniata. Um, but of course, they kind of discontinued um, their business as it was. Obviously, Adjust will not discontinue. Um, so there might be some questions around the independence. The other point, which Josh was saying, again, there is a there is a, there is a couple of factions around this subject. Don't switch because it's complicated, and certainly don't do it with the IDFA story coming about. Uh, do switch because they know more than they should. Uh, App Lovin will find out more than, they but reality is it's all predicated on trust, which is what Josh was saying because when you work with other ad networks, be it Facebook, or when you're working with your independent MMP, you know, you are trusting through uh, technical means, a lot of information you're handing them in order to obtain, again, better efficiency from your growth engine, right? And so it just goes back to the ideal of, can they build a trusting image in this new vertically integrated situation that allows us to continue happily working uh, with, with them on different fronts, be it attribution, ad monetization, and so on. Um, that question remains completely unanswered, of course. Yeah, and I, I think you're bringing up a good point about trust, right? Because you're giving very critical and sensitive data to AppLove and to Zynga are these companies that we can trust? Now, look, nothing's been proven about AppLovin, but you go back historically, it's not only the hyper casuals and other companies, but even going back to the earlier days of ad networks, like there were a lot of rumors about AppLovin bidding into Flurry, AdMob, Mopub, you know, Fiber, uh, Iron Source, and then taking that data and end rounding and taking sources directly from those ad networks. And I think Lippo, didn't you work for, <laughs> maybe, maybe you can comment on that, but like, so there's been a history of at least allegations and it's not like Zynga has the cleanest his history as well in terms of, you know, protecting sensitive data. And again, nothing proven, but, you know, from this, from a trust perspective, what, where do you guys kind of come out in terms of, can we trust these companies, AppLovin, Zynga, more on the way, and you know, I won't go into that stuff, but with all of this sensitive data. Guys, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, like I think everyone needs to agree, trust is really important. Uh, I think one thing that I, I would love is, um, I think more transparency from AppLovin and IronSource as well. They're left out a lot uh, about how our data is used would be very instructive and reduce a lot of fears, even if the reality isn't exactly what we would like to hear. I think transparency would be appreciated and it would help um, publishers understand the granularity of who, like, w which games, you know, where, when, why they want to work with AppLovin or IronSource. 
because really um, there, there, there are, re I think for most studios, Iron Source is a great partner and Apple Living is a great partner, um, depending on your stage of development. Um, I think I've heard, maybe on this talk or another talk, but like if your game is in soft launch, it might not be the best time to integrate those partners. Yeah, if your yeah. game is highly innovative and looks to be highly successful, it might not be the best time to integrate those partners. Now, if you have multiple closed competitors already on the AppLovin platform and the value, the incremental value to AppLovin of your data is significantly reduced and your upside is unchanged by working with them because they're still in growth, that could be compelling. Yeah. Um, if, you're if you're totally reliant on ad monetization, um, having what I see as um, the most powerful uh, mediation stack could be worth it. Um, if you if your game has been in live ops for like three years or five years or ten years, uh, then your data might actually this might hurt some people's feelings, but it might not be quite as unique and secret as you might think. Um, so at that <laughs> point, maybe. Um, that is a time to work with AppLovin, yeah. but it's really hard without the transparency. It's really hard to make um, good decisions. And it tends to mean people are going to extremes. And I think AppLovin and IronSource, because they're both doing it, um, could possibly benefit by increasing their transparency. Yeah. I mean, I think from my perspective, like there's kind of two sort of perspective or two sort of angles for transparency. One is like the sort of measurement, right? Like, you know, I'm I'm seeing what's coming in through my MMP versus what's coming in through other sources and the numbers are really off. Like, you know, that's sort of measurable transparency. And the other is just like this macro like perception, right? Which is very difficult to quantify, but I think it's pretty important because in my experience, like game developers are somewhat irrational sort of animals, right? And they're going to focus in on certain things. Uh, and, you know, having worked at a game publisher who then started building original games, like that was our primary concern was what's the perception going to be. And we focus a lot of our messaging around like trying to, you know, allay any of those concerns, right? So I think, you know, I sort of agree with what folks are saying, like, you know, it, it, communicating this. And I think the challenge maybe for app love is they're on the path to IPO. Right. And so they can't really say much at all about anything. Uh, but, you know, like if we rewind, we, you know, we knew that they were working on games, right. We knew about matching dimension. We knew about the stuff before it was announced. And so whoa, 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 hold up, hold up. We knew because people found out stuff, not because they're like, right. Hey, no, we own I'm, these studios. That, no, that's what I'm saying. Right. That's what yeah. I'm saying. And that's sort of the, the his, history. Right. Yeah. And so people, if I'm, I'm wondering like what else is going on that we don't know about, like right, what right, else right. is happening. Yeah. Uh, and I think one of the trends I think we'll see is I think, like Josh, other Josh touched on as a soft launch is more people are going to be going and doing the scopely like secret LLC thing. And, you know, basically like masking as much as possible, especially like larger scale players, like uh, these early games and early concepts. Uh, we're already seeing it now with glue and some of these other companies where, you know, you can't just look under their account and see what's going on. And I think that's going to be the sort of, uh, you know, out, outcropping of this sort of uh, change in the market um, from a, because of basically like tr concerns around trust and, and uh, it's, it's a difficult subject, but I think it's really important. And it's, I don't know what the necessarily the answer is, but more communication would be better than none or less. Right. Yeah. I have a really, sorry, Aviad, I didn't want to uh, jump over just a really quick uh, thing to say that the, you know, the, there is no watchdog, right? And there is no, uh, it, it's like Joe was saying about people find out stuff and then it comes out. But it's very telling when the kind of unofficial watchdog, let's say Apple, right? Comes out with, with 
new systems to protect privacy, which essentially say to all of us, MMPs, ad networks, developers, everyone in the ecosystem, I simply don't trust you with all of this stuff. So you're going to follow my system, which is by no means perfect. And so we're all living in an ecosystem of mistrust. You're, regardless of our personal opinion, there is a sort of a, of a mistrusting uh, factor. Yeah. So I actually have a question for you guys, for everyone. So people, I have to, so at what point, you know, if I own an MMP and I create content, uh, at what point is the data more valuable to me internally versus the revenue I generate from offering it as a, as a sort of SaaS service? So basically the idea of like having exclusive access to that data set versus the revenue I generate and the revenue I can generate from that access, exclusive access versus, you know, charging whatever they charge you guys per month. I don't know. Is that not an interesting question? I, to me, that's pretty, a pretty interesting question considering the scale of, of some of these companies. I think it's incredibly interesting. I think it's almost, uh, uh, I've got the, the better answer than me. Go ahead. Um, I'd say it's also almost unanswerable. And I don't know exactly what they're doing, um, but it definitely seems like if you think about the Iron Source and um, App Love and ad networks and mediation platforms as essentially expansions of their portfolio of games and you're tapping into their cross promotion network, um, they certainly seem to be optimizing based off of their ROI. Um, so it's, it's, it might be that if you're bidding a $10 CPM and one of their internal games is bidding a $10 CPM, um, that they might break that tie in favor of their own internal game. We don't really know. Um, I was just curious because yeah. Filippo mentioned, you know, Omnia, Omniata, which is I think bought by King, right? So, you know, in that scenario, they're just using the technology and whatever recurring revenue maybe was not that much. I don't know. But, you know, say like an adjust is making some people guess like 100, 200 million like run rate, annual run rate. Uh, and, you know, so that's a different scale than maybe some of these smaller players that the technology is the main value. Anyway, I was just curious what people oh, thought. Actually, I, I did not answer your question. No, the data is much more valuable than the revenues, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, Actually, eventually. it's a company that uh, is just uh, moments from IPO, right? So there is a, there is a strategic meaning to that. I, I did want to touch back on the trust question uh, before I dropped off. Um, so I, I think that the trust question, I mean, it's a legitimate question, but it's a bit naive in, in the, the business world, right? Because, uh, I mean, we can trust or not trust people, but eventually we make decisions according to values, uh, business values, right? And, and if at the end of the day, this integration between MMP, Ad Network, Game Studio will generate a higher value to us as businesses, we will keep using it. Uh, even if it's biased or it's you know it's it's not ethical, think about Facebook in the early days, uh, and even today you can still bid in Facebook and advertise your game without sharing data, but you will be limited to specific bids, right? So you can bid CPC without sharing install data, you can bid CPI without sharing in-app events, and so on. But eventually, nobody is using it. Nobody is bidding CPC for app installs. Nobody is bidding. Uh, is bidding CPI anymore for app event optimization. And the thing about Facebook is that they generate such a high value to us that we're willing to share um, data um, uh, just, to, just to gain that value from their optimization and, and, um, and their auction systems. Right. So, so I think I'll, that at the end of, yeah. Well, Aviad, I was gonna just say, you know, one problem, and I, I, think, I totally get your point, but I think one problem that exists in a lot of companies is like this, separation between the understanding of risks for a UA manager or performance team relative to management. Because a lot of the CEOs at some of these companies don't understand the risk. And if you are a UA manager at a company and you're thinking, okay, my performance, if I use app Lovin, my performance improves. And do they kind of in the back of their mind know, well, I'm kind of giving data away 
then we might get competed against. The CEO may not know that, but as a performance manager, I, for my own individual performance, may right. roll the dice. So, so I think so that's- let me ask you that. Okay. As you as the CEO will go to your UA manager and say, hey, bring me twice the LTV, but don't share data. Uh, what, 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 what are yeah. you leaving to do? You know, you, right. well, I, no I think tool. what I'm saying is that these two worlds right now are kind of separated in a lot of game studios because of the lack of understanding of executives and management teams I relative agree. to the UA team. And so the performance team has a certain incentive, motivation, understanding a risk for themselves. Mm -hmm. And these things are not currently being shared a lot, which is yeah. why you wind up with situations where potentially bad things I've been happen. working with a lot of game studios who yeah. had, who had, you know, those two different roles or they, some game studio, also, uh, they also have a, um, a chief information officer, right? So they, yeah. they're responsible for all of the data and, and securities and stuff. And they're always putting the, um, the blocks for the UA team, right? Don't share data, don't integrate the SDK, don't do this and this and that. And eventually they don't manage to, to hit their goals and targets. And I, I can tell you that from working with those guys, the companies who um, refused to share data, they were always behind. They were always yeah. lagging. At the end of the day, they, they shared the data. They, they couldn't stay there uh, because they, they couldn't move forward with generating revenues and making profitable UA activities because they, they didn't use the advantages of the networks uh, that, that, that could provide them the, the right user, users with data. Yeah. So I, I, I don't see how those things can, can correlate in, in today's world. I mean, if you want to get value, you need to share data. And that's what you, you know, you, it's a give and take. Yeah, although, you know, but I, I, I what I, I guess my point is that you need to understand what risks you're taking. And I think to Josh Chanley's point, you know, it, it also comes down to the, your situational context, right? Like for some games, for some situations, you may not be in that much da danger. So maybe it's okay to share the data. Although then again, even if you are, uh, you know, a forever franchise 10 years in, and you, you then start using a very innovative you know, marketing creative or something like that. And, you know, App Lovin or Zynga also has a similar game. Well, they, they now know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's but, true for a handful of advertisers, right? That yeah. can allow themselves to, to advertise in the, in, the, in the Super Bowl commercial and, 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 and hit hundreds of millions in users and, and bring them in through brands, uh, brands activities. But let's face it, most of us do need the UA. We do need um uh to to buy the exact user at the exact cost in order to be profitable and for that you know for the scientific ua work we need to share the data um now i agree that there is a risk but you are also generating a risk by not sharing the data and not generating the value for your for your game right okay. so it, it's it, it's a uh, there's always the work of risk analysis and mitigation in, in our world, you know. Uh, but but at the end of the day, bottom line, if we take it back to the uh, to the subject of you know what Applevin is doing by acquiring more more companies, by getting in more data, by becoming more uh, uh, consolidated, yes, there is a risk. Yes, there might be also uh, an ethical question there. But at the end of the day, do they generate more value to us? If they do, I would use them. I would go with the flow, you know? I mean, at the end of the day, Applevin can offer you now attribution, monetization, user acquisition, game publishing. I mean, as a new developer, you get everything you need, a one-stop shop to grow and scale your game. Yeah, and I think that's the the now the IPO messaging, right? If you go right. to the website, it's app Wouldn't marketing. You jump on the opportunity if it's working well. Josh Chanley, did you have a point? Yeah, I wanted to go back and say that kind of doubling down this theme is your data might not be as secure as you think, even without App Love and Iron Source integrated. Okay. You gave JK the example of like a major creative breakthrough. Does anybody here think that if you have a major creative breakthrough, only App Love and Iron Source are positioned to detect that? No, I mean, that's. No, but you'd know the exact. IPMs, <laughs> the exact, you know what I'm saying? Like that, you'd know the exact numbers. Yeah, I mean, but Sumo sells that as a service, I believe. 
Well, but that's, so I think what JK is saying, right, mm -hmm. is, uh, and what you're saying is the execution. Yeah. So if this vertically integrated situation allows you to minimize the risk that what, what Aviad was talking about, and then what I was saying before, which is the efficiency is maximized, risk is minimized, efficiency is maximized, go to market, execution, boom. You're on top of everyone in three seconds. Yeah, I, I'm saying so, that like App Levin, Iron Source, whoever, you can actually build a model. Like, yeah, sure, without external data, is this creative doing well? Yeah, it's doing well. But with, <laughs> you know, once you're integrated, you, I can actually build a very specific budgeting model to, you know, <laughs> to, to compete against you. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really strong point. Okay. Yeah, and you have a more favorable cost structure because you own the inventory, right? So then even the same exact model becomes more efficient. Yeah, and illegal, but you could potentially front run. <laughs> anyway, okay, so kind of going, let's dive deeper into MNP. So a couple of points. First, so there aren't that many MNPs out there, right? I mean, you know, Adjust got taken out. There's AppsFlyer, there's Tengen, there's Kuchava. And Zynga is clearly going to probably pick off one of those. And, you know, who knows what other companies are going to kind of come out of this mix. And, you know, maybe some of the bigger organizations also suddenly decide whether it's a Playrix or some other company. Hey, we're going to do the same thing too. So, how, so two questions. One, you know, how hard is it to switch MMPs to, you know, just in, in terms of post IDFA deprecation? how valuable is the MMP data? But maybe the first point, um, Filippo, you actually have actual experience switching MMP. So maybe you could speak to that. And then Aviad, I know you sit in a very interesting position with, between MMPs and ad networks. So we, we can have you comment, but maybe starting with you, Filippo. Yeah, it's really hard uh, in simple terms here without going into uh, too much technical detail. Um, in a business like this that doesn't have an official source of truth, every MMP has a slightly different way of uh, measuring things like retention or uh, some things are more standardized, like, you know, at time of open, that's an install. Uh, we have a sort of a common agreement on that, but nothing is like, you know, how do I officially measure retention? Is it the classic approach or some other approach and, and, and other bits and pieces like that. So then when you, especially when you're well integrated in the back end, you need to kind of translate from the, the, the incumbent system to a new system. There is a lot of loss in translation there. And uh, not to mention, of course, the execution of having to stop all your campaigns and restart them immediately and what, what other impacts that has. So this whole, um, this is a narrative that I don't entirely agree with that everyone's sort of running for the door panicking going oh run away from adjust especially at a time like now the ios doing these things it's not a wisest idea i would be carefully considering that before making that move uh, as we were discussing mmps may or may not be gaining value in the current situation with ios um <clears throat> So we need to uh, be careful before saying, yeah, you know, it's just uh, by default a dangerous situation and you need to switch. It might actually be to your advantage to stay and join the app love verticalized solution, right? Where there might be further data enriching services that you can buy, you know? Especially if you want monetize with Max because you already share the data. So there is no reason for you to, to get away from it, you know? Right. Okay. And then Aviad, in terms of maybe you could tell us a little bit about, you know, a little bit about BitShake and how it kind of sits in between ad networks, MMPs. And then in terms of what do you think as far as some of these issues that we were talking about with respect to whether it's switching MMPs or the value of MMPs going forward post IDFA? For sure. Yeah. So uh, BitShake is a marketing automation tool. So basically, what we do. <clears throat> we are integrated to all of the different ad networks and SAN, so anywhere from Facebook, Google, TikTok, uh, FLOV and Iron Source. So everything is integrated to BeCheck. Uh, so on one hand, we are somewhat of a cost aggregation and data aggregation platform. We have a lot of analytics capabilities, but you can also manage all of your campaigns through a single dashboard. So you don't really need to 
log in and out to all the different uh, um, networks uh, um, plat platforms in order to make the bids and budget changes. We also have automation models and so on and so on. So basically it's a one place to see all of the data, uh, including the MMP data and, and manage the campaigns from a single, a single dashboard. Uh, so that's regarding to be checking what we do, and that really puts us in, in a unique position because we're really in the center of everything, right? So we work with the ad networks, we work, we work with the MMPs, and we work with the actual developers, with the BIs, and so on. Um, so it gives us a good perspective uh, throughout the, uh, the ecosystem. Um, as for a question about the MMPs, how difficult it is, it's very difficult. I've seen more than five or even more big advertisers trying to change MMPs, it's probably uh, their uh, worst nightmare. They didn't know what to expect, especially if you're big and you have a lot of historical data. So anything that you use in order to predict LTVs will break uh, because once you change the, the MMPs, it's almost impossible to attribute back, uh, especially now with the loss of IDFAs. I don't know how, they, how anyone can attribute you know, recurring revenues to older users. Um, so that's really, it's, it's a nightmare for developers. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it if there is no very good reason. Um, I'm not sure if the, uh, you know, the data security issue with, uh, with Adjust will now justify moving, moving away. As I said before, if you already monetize with Max, then you already share your data with AppLovin. So there is not a real um good reason to do that if you're not and you are not a game developer and you work with adjust again there's almost no risk for you because uh app Lovin are developing games and mainly hyper casual games so there is no risk for you to share commerce data or any other uh, vertical that is not hyper casual game at this moment. Do, do you right? work with AppLovin, Javier? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying that. Uh, uh, it, Is that it just Adam's picture sense. in your background? <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> but uh, to be fair, reinforcing what, uh, I mean, I just, this, we have to, you know, say something important. Uh, Adjust remains a German company and here yeah. comes the European in me, proud European, following German regulations. So you can't, you know, that certain rules will have to be abided by, not to yeah. mention GDPR as a European company. So, yeah. you know, I mean, whatever has to happen, which might be slightly more nefarious, has to be super well hidden and under the desk because, you know, the German authorities are clearly, you know, not to be trifled with. Um, so that, that much is certain. Okay, but maybe we could dig deeper in terms of the value of MMPs, right? Post IDFA deprecation, right? Like, uh, Aviad, it'd be great to hear from you. How valuable are MMPs post IDFA deprecation? Because with SK Ad Network, you get very limited data. Do we still get that full picture of COGS revenue? Like, what would we have, or what's the danger of the MMP data post IDFA deprecation? Yeah, that's definitely the bigger question. You know, uh, yeah. it's not only if you want to stay with adjust post the acquisition. It's more of like, do we really need MMPs now that we don't have IDFAs anymore? Right. So, um, so on one hand, I think I think we should stick with the MMPs for now because they do provide good enough solutions. I mean, I know for a fact that uh, Apps Fire, for example, they're uh, predictive uh, um, measurement tool is uh, from my from the last uh, discussion I had with them. It's above ninety percent accurate when they compare it um, uh, to the previous uh, attribution with IDFA. So it's it's pretty decent. Uh, so it is valuable. The problem right now with with SK Ad Network is that you're very limited in both the uh, the time of the event. So they only give you a maximum 48 hours for the event to occur until they can post it back and attribute it uh, to the right network. And also the amount of in-app conversions that you can track, it's limited to 100 and it needs to be, um, uh, it needs to be grouped into uh, different subgroups of campaigns. So you can't really um, uh, track all the events that happen in your app. It needs to be very limited 
uh, to this 100 buckets of uh, conversion values that you can track. Um, so the question stays in terms of, you know, do we really need MMPs or not? But at the end of the day, I think that the, the market will keep it will it will keep ha it will keep rolling, right? Uh, people will keep spending money. Uh, users will keep playing games. So the economy will remain. How we are going to measure it? How user value is going to look to look like day after day after we are losing the idea phase? It's it's still an enigma, and I think that there is a lot of um, uh, panic in the industry because of that. In my honest opinion, I think that um, it's just going to be more fair now that we don't have IDFAs because the strong um, developers or the strong advertisers will not have the right tools right now to retain users. I think that the main problem is going to be with retention and retargeting campaigns right now because you cannot really get back to those users that are high value and bid on them again. So what's going to happen is that um, because you cannot do it, so the, 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 the advertisers who have a very good understanding of the high LTVs, they won't be able to bid very high for their top users. So if today they bid $10 for the VIP clicks, they won't be able to do it any longer. So they actually open up a lot of inventory for the small advertisers to come in and, and win the, uh, the VIP users. So I think that um, it gives an opportunity for the smaller advertisers to initiate games and uh, also start, start um, driving in very high quality users, something that was almost impossible so far. I mean, if you are competing with Zynga on their top spenders, on their top revenue generators, you will never be able to outbid them. Those guys are bidding 10, 20, $30 for a click for their VIP users. You will never do that on your user acquisition campaign, right? It will turn into hundreds of dollars in, in CPIs. So right now, without an IDFA and without the ability to retarget those two top users, I think it gives a very good opportunity to the, to the newcomers to win those VIPs and, and generate the, uh, the revenues from them. So I think that the loss of IDFAs, you know, it's a big hit to the big guys, but I don't, I'm not worried about them. They will find ways to keep monetizing their games. Uh, but I think there is a good opportunity here for the new developers to uh, to enjoy the uh, uh, the top quality traffic that was only kept for a handful of uh, of big advertisers. Yeah, so I, I actually, you know, uh, there, there's there's a kind of thesis that the big guys get bigger after this, but I I do agree that there is also the potential for audience dispersion after this. But going back to like the MMP. And the mm. value of the MMP, what will game studios use MMPs for? Like Filippo and Josh Chandley, what is your current plan in terms of, you know, the usage of an MMP moving forward? I mean, are you, I mean, obviously like the SK ad network uh, solutions, predictive solutions that whether it's AppsFlyer or AppLovin or whoever, you know, or sorry, or adjust. Um, so obviously there's there's some use cases there, but what are you guys going to be using an MMP for? And what are you willing to pay for an MMP post IDFA deprecation? Well, I'm definitely going to dodge that second question. <laughs> um, but at the highest level, I mean, what we're going to use MMPs for is the same as what we've been using them for, which is to um, manage our attribution and measure our marketing performance. Um, you know, in terms of how unique that value is on iOS specifically, I, I think it'll be really, it's going to be an interesting six months. I think that there are a lot of ways that it could play out, whether it's probabilistic attribution and doing the old ways of measuring ARPU curves and applying that to spend of campaigns, or using SK ad network conversion values to try to map LTV to that and actually measure the campaigns and probably using um, the probabilistic approach to define the conversion value as opposed to the attribution. There's a lot of ways that that particular nut can be cracked. I definitely think that 
if it turns out being that using the IDFA or the the no IDFA SK ad network approach where you're um, relying on those SK ad network conversion values, if that is the approach that becomes dominant, I think MMPs are very well positioned to be providing a lot of value going forwards. Filippo, what do you think? How much uh, are you going to spend, uh, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, that's a difficult question, the pricing one. Very difficult. Um, yeah, the, what Josh is saying is very interesting because what we've seen is uh, some of the MMPs really trying to innovate to bring us uh, a different value in what they're doing. And that's been interesting to observe, the, the various solutions that have been coming up <clears throat> uh, from, from different companies. Uh, I mean, Gochava has one thing and uh, AppsFlyer is another thing. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's been interesting to observe the innovations. How valuable will these innovations be? The market will judge in the coming months because um, uh, a lot of what's happening there is also internally focused on how we deal with our data and how we use it to fight those inefficiencies in UA and so on. So is this ultimately going to work for um, the paradigm shift of how we measure iOS UA? We shall see. Um, am I going to switch? Absolutely not. It's, it's not, you know, uh, we will keep using them because they're part of our um, value chain, our stack yeah, oh, internally. Well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, are you, are you dying? Right, no, what are you using that, now, Flipio? I thought you were asking me something, Josh, sorry. No, I was just saying workflow. They're part of the workflow, which right. I don't want to disrupt. Yeah. Sorry, Filippo, who are you using right now? Are you using a Josh? AppsFlyer. Oh, AppsFlyer, okay. Josh so, didn't mention who he's using, actually. Uh, we were using AppsFlyer also. Oh, well, <laughs> there you go. That was easy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, like, from the macro perspective, I think that the natural progression is what we're seeing, right, is going to be consolidation, where basically, you know, you have the app level and positioning as sort of the app marketing platform. And then I think others are going to feel pressure to add add more services and tools under like one umbrella. So that could be through innovation. It could be through acquisition, could even be through some type of strange bundling partnerships is like a first testing the waters of, you know, working together uh, because I think, you know, there's gonna be pricing pressure, right? So how can you continue to sustain your, especially if you're a company that's raised a ton of money uh, you're going to be under sort of pressure there to how to sort of sustain your revenue growth. So that could be, through just bringing in different companies that have run rate or adding additional services and then being able to charge more um, as under the justification for having additional sort of stuff under one sort of umbrella. And I think we'll talk about some of that later on about- Well, let, let's talk about that now, Josh Burns. So industry ecosystem shakeout, yeah. right? there aren't a lot of players out there. Zynga said they're gonna go after an MMP. I mean, that, you know, publicly. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, if, you, if you look, there's not a lot of MMPs there's sort of two perspectives. One is like the revenue run rate. There's not much there, right? There's not a lot at scale. Technology-wise, there's probably interesting stuff that if you are just looking to bring in the technology, but there's not a ton of players. Well, the base this. technology is pretty much commodity, right? I think it would be more this like machine learning based stuff against like SK Ad Network that would be more valuable if, if I'm understanding it. Expertise, right. yeah. I mean, expertise, technology, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, but you have... There's not a huge long tail, right? So, right. so Josh Burns and Aviad, who does Zynga buy? Is it AppsFlyer or Tengen? I said Tengen. <laughs> Tengen. I mean, to me, to me, Tengen makes sense, right? Because it's, uh, uh, you know, the cost structure is lower. Zynga, you know, is a public company, so they're probably going to be looking for, to me, bring in something focused on the technology, right? And there's a huge, obviously, hyper casual focus historically. Uh, and they have, that's where they've been focused recently around Rolex and all that kind of stuff. So to me, it seems like to be a no brainer if they're going to go that route, but we'll see. Aviad, who, who does Zynga buy and why does nobody mention Kochava? <laughs> why does their name not get brought up? <laughs> or Singular. <laughs> yeah, Singular's name also, I haven't heard, but yeah, they're, I mean, oh, so please explain. Hey, Aviad, Singular, <laughs> tell us. Singular acquired Epsilar, which is an MMP. Yeah. And they now offer cost aggregation plus attribution. They actually get some good traction lately 
they grow with the number of clients and I, I know that they, uh, uh, they're doing a good job there. So it could be Tenjin. I mean, that, that will be the first thing that will uh, uh, jump to my head, yeah. but it could also be Singular. Okay. Like, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine Zynga pivoting to like have part of their business servicing like external clients. I think the complexity there. Think of the data, Tenjin, I mean, they do have a lot of data when it comes to hyper-casual games, um, but but Zynga is mostly leaning on IAP. So maybe it could be, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, historically, yes, but now, now recently, with Wally, yeah. like with the acquisitions. Uh, yeah, I mean, and then you have, you know, Branch, uh, you know, Singular, there's there's some other stuff, but it gets re- pretty long tail really fast. So there's not a huge right. number of sort of options out there, depending on what your focus is. One question I have is like, what's the rubric that Zynga should be using to pick their acquisition target? I mean, it seems to me that the MMP that encourages and enables their clients to give them the richest source of data would be most valuable, but it's not clear to me who that would be and if that is the correct rubric that Zynga should be applying. Right. And then the one other question, I I think we didn't dive into it too much, but post IDFA deprecation, given what Apple's doing, does switching an MMP now become so easy that, you know, if, if you're looking at acquisition, do you care about the customer base or not? Or is, am I right about that? I mean, please, please push back on whether, <laughs> whether that's not the case. It really depends on how, how much you lean on their non-IDFA solutions, right? Because yeah. once you started using SK network, you don't really um, tie tied back to those um, to those attribution services. Um, well, it, I think it also depends what you want, right? Do you want the data? Do you want the technology? Do you want the re- recurring revenue, which is like the customers? So if I'm app loving, like all three of those things are great for me based on my focus. If I'm Zynga, I don't, I'm not pivoting to become sort of some type of app marketing platform most likely. So I'm probably focused on, I don't know, the data and technology. So that's where I think a smaller player makes sense. Okay. Uh, so we're saying 10 gen within six months picked off by Zynga. <laughs> you're making me say so something. Let's start the rumors right here. <laughs> this was a, a session about verticalization and integration, <laughs> but Joe managed to introduce his bit about we have to yeah. disclose our, our holdings now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about market predictions. I mean, uh, I, I think, you know, obviously Tengen is is the best bet. But if you really want to harp on the, the Zynga subject, why wouldn't Zynga buy Bidshake, for example? You know? I mean, yeah, Aviad, why, why not? <laughs> I'd have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> This, he said no comment. <laughs> well, one other question I had is like, okay, so we have these MMPs. They have a pretty high cost structure with the potential to the question that you dodged, Josh Shanley, of the value potentially compressing. And then we have a limited number of players, right, that may potentially start getting picked off. Is there any reason to prevent a new player from coming in because the the base, you know, attribution, marketing, performance type of technology is relatively commodity and everyone's starting from zero when it comes to like, you know, well, relatively close to zero when it comes to SK ad network optimization. So what if a new player comes into the market and says, hey guys, we're charging a thousand dollars a month and we're or, gonna be completely independent forever. Or it's Maybe free. Yeah. It's or, or free, yeah. Uh, so yeah. What, what do you guys think about that? Do you guys think that there's an opportunity for a newer player that might be, to do free, you'd probably have to be associated with some other kind of service offering and could potentially use the data in different ways, but. Unity. Yeah, I would, I would say um, that one of the tough, the reasons I would say no, is I think that the value um, of an MMP is actually, it's more valuable as part of a larger service offering than it is as 
an MMP. I mean, like the application that it has um, with App Loven is just extreme. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Iron Source try to mimic this. So could you dig into that, Josh, in terms of like the application with App Loven? So what are you talking about more specifically? Yeah, okay, so starting, um, I guess starting from the top, um, I mean, App Loven in general has a bunch of key technologies that are just incredibly synergistic. Um, their big goal appears to be um, to be the ultimate like growth engine. Like imagine if the App Store optimized for revenue or ROAS. Um, and the two most prominent parts of it before the adjust were its namesake, the ad network, um, and their ad mediation platform, Max, which to me is probably the top performing platform out there by a, a solid margin, um, really, really strong technology. Mm -hmm. um, so combining those two things, like why are they more powerful together than apart? You know, why is Iron Source sucking up all this strategy as well? Um, well, I mean, first of all, Max feeds back either ad revenue data or high quality estimates to the ad network which allows App Loven to be the only platform that I know of that allows you to optimize for both IAP and IAA or in-app ad ROAS. They call it auto ROAS. Essentially, um, you can, instead of bidding a cost per install, you can tell them, well, I want my day zero ROAS to be X. I genuinely don't care if the cost per install is $1 or $1 million. What I would like to have is, is this ROAS. And because they have this unique piece of getting not just the IAP, but the IAA revenue. And for certain players that even if you're on like an 80-20 split with 20% ad, that IAA piece for certain players can be extremely valuable and provide incremental growth for you. Um, and so that, that's a really uh, powerful tool. And essentially that's all built and works based on looking at all these monetization events coming in. It has one clear weakness though. It's really, really hard to predict LTV based on revenue events alone. Um, there's probably a reason they're allowing us to optimize for day zero ROAS rather than day seven or day 30 or day 360 ROAS. Because right. revenue is not that instructive. Um, you know, re retention and engagement events are critical pieces of the puzzle. Um, but, now, but now that's, okay. Yeah. You're gonna go, yeah. don't worry. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly, no. So the adjust acquisition gives them access to substantial, exactly that data, exactly that data. Um, you can see how valuable that is in predicting LTV because AppsFlyer is productizing it. They're, they just announced predicts. That's them saying, yes, this data is very predictive. We're calling it predicts. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's feasible that when you combine these things that, I mean, eventually App Loving could be the only platform where you can buy optimized for day 360 ROAS. That's feasible. Um, and it's exclusively feasible for them. And in that um, context, it gives them a stronger advantage rather than on the other developers, but yeah. against Iron Source and Unity, because they all have a ROAS optimizing solution, but not with this level of uh, data enrichment that you're talking about. So think about where Uploving got this, this capability. I mean, they bought Machine Zone, probably the, the best LTV prediction team I've worked with. Uh, without saying anything good about them, just that's because you haven't worked with me yet. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Look, machine Zone, I mean, they have like a, a very well oiled machine for LTV prediction, and Lion has a pretty amazing IAA uh, revenue generation, lots of data there. So, yeah. I mean, you don't really need more than a lot of data to predict IAA, right? Um, so, so they, they have all the capabilities to, to do the best job and they are doing the best job and now they just need a retention data to complete the picture and they got it from a chest. They agree with I, job. So I have to ask then again, like, I, like if you're, if you have the best technology, at what point you're like, Hey, we're just gonna use it ourselves. Like to me, that's a natural 
step, right? If you have, but you can do both, you can use it for yourself and. But I'm just saying the value you. then becomes if I only, I have that, I'm going to stop offering those, those tools and technology to other com- external companies. Well, if I have the content. Well, no, I'm just saying that uh, if you're going to use it only for your games, then each additional revenue bucket will have uh, an incremental cost to it as well, right? You need to produce more games. Being, being a SaaS company allows you uh, to distribute the technology with a much higher margin without such a significant increase of costs. So that could be a good reasoning for that. Yeah, I would agree. I think that the fact that other publishers are in their network it is not something that's going to be curtailed. I actually think it's a source of value for them. Um, the way I think about it in my head is the games that they own and publish, those are sources of potentially exclusive inventory. Uh, they're not actually exclusive inventory. I I buy Wordscapes installs an iron source. It's weird, but it happens a lot. Um, so they, they operate as businesses normally as well. Um, and the tier below that is when you have Max running your ad stack. And now you have essentially, it's less exclusive, but they still clearly have right of first refusal. They're managing the bids and they're bidding and they're seeing more data. Um, and that has a lot of incremental value for them. And they're still gonna operate as an ad network as well where when you're not even mediating through them, they're still gonna bid on your inventory because this allows them to penetrate and access more inventory, not just to sell to other people, but for their own um, for their own internal demand. It, it allows them to scale that just much, much further. All right, well, you know, we've been talking for a long time, guys. I, Clearly an interesting topic. So maybe what we could end with is just one final thought or prediction or message to the audience. I don't know if you guys have anything. Filippo, you got anything? Just sit tight and <laughs> watch it unfold. That's what I, that's my best message. I would rather sort of uh, make people be calm, have an opinion of course, but like, yeah. you know, reduce the noise because uh we we're generating a lot of noise we're stuck at home with covid and we're frustrated and we're stressed kids and whatnot but we have to you know take it down a notch because we're we're causing most of the problems that shouldn't be there and we'll see things panning out differently i think josh see yeah i think filippo has wise words to say here um, I, I think this is a, a game of agility. It's such a complicated environment that I don't think anyone should be expected to be totally correct. I think we should be positioning ourselves to have options um, and keeping our ears to the ground and seeing what's happening. And also, thanks for this conversation, guys. This was really fun, really interesting. Aviad? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, same here. I will. Uh, I will join the same uh, instructions there. <laughs> I wouldn't be the first one to make dramatic moves. I mean, there's too many changes. You know, the IDFA, the acquisitions, the consolidation. There's too much happening for anyone to be able to make the right decision, right? Uh, so I wouldn't be the first one to make drastic changes in order to confront with that. Uh, let's sit and wait and see what happens for sure. Josh Burns. Uh, the last word, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that the wait and see is interesting because I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation. That's going to be more, more and more diverse, meaning like, you know, not just content, content consolidation. So I don't know, I think sticking with what's working right now, rather than trying to change things around might be a good strategy because who knows who will be part of what company in two to three months anyway. While you wait and see, I just want to say, don't forget to play Battle Legion. (laughs) Shameless. Shameless. So my last bits of advice is really, I think that people do need to understand these issues better and really understand the risk. And to the point that I made earlier, I really feel that 
increasingly UA managers with management and executives are going to have to get in better alignment and understand these risks together. So that yeah. would be my final take. And, you know, again, I think Josh Hanley made a good point. Situational context, you know, different companies are going to have different levels of risks for your situation. You need to make the right choice for yourself. So with that, guys, thank you very much for your time. Interesting conversation against a very strategic and important topic in our industry today. And for our audience, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.